My dear sisters, just to put in perspective that why this topic is important to learn for all ages, sometimes what happens is that we kind of think, oh, I'm married for this many years, this topic is not for me. Okay? And sometimes we think about, oh, I'm not looking to get married yet, this topic is not for me. So this topic is for someone who is seeking it. But I would like to just, you know, put things a little bit in perspective that this is not the case. Marriage is ibadah. Just like any other ibadah, in Islam, marriage falls under the category of ibadah. And just like as Muslims, we should learn about the ibadahs that other ibadahs that are forth upon us. It is important for us that we keep learning and updating our knowledge about this thing as well. Okay, so just a few points that I wanted to uh, uh, highlight to put this topic in perspective. But before I go into it, when I was preparing to come here and talk about this, this I remembered this story that I heard long time ago. And this story is about Rabia al-Basariya. I think many of you know about her. She's a ninth century saint. She's a Muslim saint and her spirituality and her spiritual stories are of great, great importance. So one day, Sayyida Rabia al Basariya was looking for her keys under the light on the street. So she was outside her home and she was looking for her keys and she was trying to search her keys under the, under, uh, uh, the light on the street. So she was looking and looking and looking and was not able to find it. So the, the neighbors were watching her. They also came out. And this is, sh uh, we should uh, help her find the keys that she has lost. So she all, they also started to look for the keys with her. And they were tired and this is, uh, Saida, where did you lose it? And she said, in the home. And they all looked at her and says, really? You lost the keys in the home and we are looking over here so, and one of them kind of laughed at her. And this is the opportunity that she was looking for. You know, and she said, when we lose it here, when we lose our happiness and our joy and our peace in here, why do we look for the solution outside? That's powerful. That's powerful. She was trying to make this analogy that I lost the keys in my home. I lost the peace in my heart. I lost the peace and joy and happiness in my heart. But I'm looking for it on the street outside. She says, similarly, human beings, they lose their peace and joy and happiness inside, but they look for the key to unlock that outside. They look in the society. They look for it in shopping. They look for it in the friends. They look for it in family, they never look inside. And I thought this is such a powerful story, especially for marriage, and Sister Hala is going to tell us more about that, that before we learn about tips for a happy marriage, I think it starts here, inside. Who am I? What are my values? What bad habits do I have? Where do I need to change? And this was such a powerful story that I learned from her many, many years ago. I was reading a book and I came across that and the story stuck with me forever. What was the name? Rabia al-Basariya. Rabia al-Basariya is a ninth century Muslim saint. Someday we need to do a class on her. She's such an amazing woman, you know, ahead of her time. So now, now coming back to our topic of marriage today and putting it in perspective a little bit, my dear sisters, marriage is an important ibadah in Islam. There was a scholar, he was, uh, and we call him a sinner turned into a saint. His name was Bishr al-Hafi. If you study Islamic literature, you will see his name coming up in the spiritual studies. So Bishr al-Hafi passed away. And he came to somebody in a dream. And they asked, Ya Bishr, how Allah Ta'ala treated you? He said, I have been given the gardens of heaven. I can look upon the, the Anbiya from where I am. But, and then the question was asked, so what happened to Abu Nasir al-Tamurai? 
And he said, because Abu Nasr al-Tamara is an other scholar of his time, he said, his levels are 70 times higher than me. And the question was asked, how? In the world, our thought process was, you are more pious than him. You never met it. You spent a life of spirituality. But he said, Abu Nasir al-Tamari got this level 70 times higher than me because he was married. Because he took on the responsibility of a family. He has been given this, this, uh, this lofty place in the paradise because of his daughter, because of his son, because of the responsibilities of marriage that he took upon. And my dear si sisters, you will agree that marriage is a responsibility. It's a bed of roses, but with a lot of thorns, right? <laughs> yeah. So, but the thing is that Allah Ta'ala has this great reward for that. Once a person came to Imam Al-Ghazali, he says, Ya Imam, should I get married or should I lead a life of devotion? Do you know what Imam Al-Ghazali said? Both. Seek both. Be married and also seek a life of devotion. This is how the lofty place of marriage is in Islam, it is in Ibadah. And you know, just wanted to share a few verses from the Quran. Allah Ta'ala have said, وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا رُسُلًا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ وَجَعَلْنَا لَهُمْ أَزْوَاجًا وَذُرِّيَّةً Allah Ta'ala said, we have sent the prophets before you and we created for them their spouses and their children. Even the prophets of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, which are special people, and they're given a special task, Allah Ta'ala also gave them spouses, the responsibility of spouses and children. You know, sometimes you imagine these people were given such huge responsibilities, such huge responsibilities of changing the humankind. And even then Allah Ta'ala gave them the responsibility of family life. How important must, have, it, must it have been? Another place in the Quran, Allah Ta'ala calls this covenant between husband and wife as mithaqan ghalidha. And the same word is used as a covenant between Allah and his messengers. Allah said, I have mithaqan ghalidha with my prophets. Similarly, the covenant between husband and wife is mithaqan ghalidha. Then another thing. That Allah Ta'ala have said over here is that وَآشِرُوهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ And stay with them in kindness. And this is my one of my favorite verses in the Quran, my dear sister. Whenever I look at this verse, I just wanted to share this verse with you. I think each and every one of us should memorize this verse. Each and every one of us. And this is a verse from Surah An-Nisa. And in Surah An-Nisa, Allah Ta'ala is trying to correct what is happening in the society. Allah Ta'ala is correcting what is happening in the society where Quran is being revealed. We all know what was the condition of the women in that society. Women were just not treated right. And the whole Surah is coming down to correct that. And Allah Ta'ala, when he's talking to men over here, because it was the men in that society that were mistreating the women. Because sometimes people say, why in these verses Allah is only talking to men? Well, he's only talking to men because it was the men, the first receivers of the revelation that were being not nice to the women. So Allah Ta'ala is talking to them and says, وَآشِرُهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ And stay with them in kindness. فَإِنْ كَرَهْتُمُهُنَّ and if you dislike something about them. And my dear sisters, this happens in marriage. So Allah Ta'ala is talking, to, talking over here to men especially. But our ulama have said, when Allah Ta'ala is talking to the men, it's the same for the women as well. But because of the context, because it was the context of Arabia, Allah is Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is talking to the men. But in, in a bigger picture, he's talking to all of us. And this is a beautiful, beautiful verse. And he says, Fa'in karehtumuhunna, that if you dislike something about your spouse, and Sister Hala will tell us, all of us do that. There is nobody, nobody is perfect, right, Sister Hala? 
Yeah. <laughs> so Allah Ta'ala says, if you dislike anything about your spouse, for asa. So maybe, but our uh, the scholars of the Arabic language have said this word for asa is like, you know, be sure, like you know, it's like this. Don't worry, I'm here. Reassurance. For asa an takrahu shay'an that you dislike something. That Allah will take out from it khayran kathira. And you know, this is the worst that I think in terms of marriage is very beautiful. It's very practical. That you dislike something. And my dear sisters, our spouses dislike something about us and we dislike something about them. There is no question about it. Yes or no? See how much in, in agreement we are over here. For in what Allah Ta'ala says, if you dislike something about them, but then again, you let it go, you turn your face away. Allah Ta'ala says that Allah will make a way out of it. Khairan kathira. How amazing is that? That you let it go, you ignore it for a happy life, for, for happiness, for, your, for the sake of the family, for the sake of the children that we all do. Allah Ta'ala says, فَأَسَى أَن تَكْرَهُ شَيْئًا وَجَجْعَلَ اللَّهُ فِيهِ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا Allah will make, and Allah is saying that. Don't worry. You dislike something, you turn your face away, I'm going to bring out khayran kathira. It can be in, in, in the shape of your children. It can be something in the akhirah. Anything. But if Allah is saying it, you dislike something about them. But instead of like, you know, changing and changing and changing, it never happens, right? <laughs> what, <laughs> what happens is that if you just, you know, turn your face away, you know, let it be. And just let it go for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah ta'ala says, he will make way out of it. I think this word khayran kathira, just focus on that. Allah will make this happen. That great, great things will happen from it if you let go of this imperfections that we have in each other. This is verse number 19, Surah An-Nisa. Because Allah Ta'ala in this verse is talking to men about treating the women good. But, you know, this is for them, and they are the first ones to be uh, addressed in that, but it is talking to all of us. So, my dear sisters, just these few words about the importance of this subject in our deen, inshallah. I will hand over to Sister Hala now, inshallah. We have the guru today, and we will learn from her, mashallah. Jazakumullah khairan kathira. Assalamu alaikum, mashallah, what beneficial knowledge. You know, sharing from the Quran, sharing from the stories, heartwarming, may Allah bless you, bless your family, everything that you do for the community. Jazakallah khair for your loving words too, I appreciate it. Bismillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulullah. Assalamu alaikum. So, <clears throat> I've had the privilege of working with thousands of Muslims, mashallah, the past 25 years. And it has really opened up my eyes to so much. And I want to share some of, some of the experiences with you. So one day, a, uh, one sister came in okay, to the office, and she was extremely angry, right? She couldn't wait to just tell me everything that is wrong about her husband, right? As soon as she's sad, it's like, he's so unreasonable. He's, and then there's always a uh, diagnosis, right? There's, and he's definitely a narcissist. I read about it. He has all the signs of being narcissistic, very just doesn't help, only thinks about his mother. Okay. And so, sister, uh, what, you know, what are you hoping from this session? I want him to change. He needs to change. Okay, sister, what, what are you putting, what are you putting in? No, I, I'm finished putting in. I, I gave, I gave 15 years, 15 years. I am not giving, okay? Does that sound familiar to some people, right? Okay, then we have the husband comes in, comes in, and he is like, this wife 
Let me tell you about my wife. She's unreasonable, angry. She's, the wife is always bipolar, okay? <laughs> bipolar. She's one minute happy, most of the time angry, not reasonable, doesn't take care of anything. Oh, brother, what, uh, what are you hoping from, from this session? What do you want? Change her. Change her and I will have some peace of mind and I will get, okay, brother, what are, what are you putting into the marriage? What, what are you doing? No, no, I, I, I work. I work. I provide the house. I provide this. That's it. Okay. So I'm sure all of this sounds very familiar, right? And, you know, the analogy I like to use, it's very much like a person who goes and works out. How many people work out here? Any working out? Okay. We got <laughs> All right. So imagine if someone, not as relatable, but that's okay. <laughs> All right. Imagine if someone comes to you and says, I have been working for three hours, working out. Nothing. It doesn't work. What would you say? I would ask them, what are you doing? What are you doing at the gym? If you're going to the gym, what exactly are you doing that is not working? And they would say, well, I'm just looking. I'm checking people out, right? <laughs> and, you know, I just want to know who's working out, who's not managing. You know, I'm, I'm kind of observing. Okay. All right. Then a second person will come. Of course, they're not going to see any results, right? Another person, and this is the kind of person that they just show up, right? The person who's in the marriage, or they come to the marriage counseling, and they just show up. Okay, I'm here. I'm here for the session, right? Then the second person says, I go to the gym one hour. No, no results. Okay, what are you doing? Ya ukhti, what are you doing at the gym? Well, I have these one-pound dumbbells, but I don't see any results. So if someone has a one pound dumbbell, they're not going to see results, right? Then you have the third person who goes to the gym and puts 20 minutes, 20 minutes, but they are pushing themselves to the limit. They are pushing hard and it's hard, right? You hear some of them screaming, right? And it's just so difficult and they're pushing. And what do they see? They see the results, okay? And I always ask my clients, I'm like, before we make a commitment, right, I want you to tell me which one are you going to be. Are you going to be guy number one, guy number two, or guy number three? Because I only want to work with people who are willing to put in the work and the effort, right? Because if in marriage, it is whatever you put into it, okay? Just like the gym. If you're just there and just watching, you're not going to benefit. If you're just showing up, I'm, I'm the wife, you're not gonna, you're, the marriage is not going to improve. If you're doing the bare minimum, it's not going to improve. The only way your marriage will improve, if you hold yourself to a higher standard and you give and you give, and that's when you're going to see the results, right? And a lot of times I ask my clients, I tell them, what, when they may be very, very frustrated. They don't want to hear this, right? And I'm like, what percentage are you putting in the marriage? And I ask each of you, very honestly, okay? Look within, because I know it's really easy to, it's all him. 95%. I may do 5%. If they, if they even claim that, right? But look within your hearts and tell me what percentage are you applying into the marriage? Not just the cooking and the cleaning. What amount of affection, what amount of energy, positivity, kindness, compliments? Would anyone want to share the percentage? Anyone? What? You're not going to say? You're going to give that? Really? Oh, that's good, mashallah. All right. He's talking about affection. Affection. Okay, yes. 90? Okay. Okay, we're going to need to whisper. Now, I'm not talking about the cooking and the cleaning 
and the kids, I'm talking about cheerfulness, I'm talking about listening and really being empathetic. Yeah. Like what's the percentage now? The, give me a percentage now. Okay, that's very honest of you. I appreciate your honesty. Someone else want to share? Yeah. 15%. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that honesty. What were you going to say? Who was going to talk? Mashallah, good, good. So you're putting in the effort and you see the results. High five, sister. <laughs> All right. So for those percentages, and each of you have a percentage in your mind, you don't have to say it out loud. You all were kind enough to share it. No judgment, okay? I really respect honesty and being, knowing where you stand, right? That percentage, you have that number? Okay. What letter grade is that? Or F. A lot of people are an F. Yes. A zero? Okay, that's, that's an F. Okay. <laughs> All right. How many of you are okay? Were you okay with getting Fs in, in school? Did anyone? Cs? <laughs> Most of you are hard-working achievers. I know one of my friends told me, she, mashallah, became a doctor. She said her parents told her, A, you, you have only A, the B is for bad. <laughs> so, Pakistani? They're Pakistani, Indian, Indian. <laughs> Dr. Harun's uh, sister. <laughs> yes. All right. So none of you would accept anything less than an A in your academics, right? I'm sure, even if you got it, some Bs, some Cs, you would never accept it from your kids, right? Okay, so if we have that kind of standard for academics, this is our grade with Allah. What grade are you getting as a wife with Allah? This is a very powerful question. And actually, in my sessions when I present it, it is a, it's, it's a paradigm shift, right? Because many times, people, they don't realize. They don't realize. They justify. They, they make excuses. But when you realize, whatever it is, then double it. Whatever you're doing, at least double. At least get that passing grade, right? You want at least a passing grade. Now, it's also another analogy I want to use is marriage is very much like taking care of a garden. Any of you into gardening? You like gardening? How, how important, you too, okay. How important is it to tend to your garden? They die, and so the sister said, if you're not diligent, your garden is like your children. You have to look after them. You have to water them. If you don't, they die. My father, Allah Yarhamhu, was, he had an amazing green thumb, and he would come home, and he would immediately change, and he loved his garden. He had all the, you know, the fruit trees, and he did amazing. My mom was jealous of the garden. <laughs> this is your baby. This is what you're excited about, right? So subhanAllah, but guess what? Because he spent time, because he watered it every day, because he changed the soil, we got amazing fruits, buckets and buckets and buckets of fig, right? So in your marriage, if you tend to your marriage the way a, a very attentive, excited, like passionate gardener would take care of their garden, you're going to get the fruits of it. If you ignore it, and if you don't water it and it dies, whose fault is that? We can't just sit there and go, ah, you know, it's, it's the flower shop I bought it from, right? No, you didn't take care of it. So we have to take responsibility. And you can't, like Sister uh, I mean, I was saying, that we cannot change the other person. 
right? I'll give you a, a story. I cannot. I, we've been married now for 26 years, mashallah, tabarakallah. I have not been able to get my husband to stop at a stop sign fully. <laughs> Especially the one in the, in the neighborhood, in our house, you know. He's like, this is just a suggestion, you know. <laughs> So I would always tell him, stop. I mean, especially when the, you know, the kids are learning how to drive and if they see Baba like rolling the stop sign, right? So early on in our marriage, I would always tell him, stop. Then one time he rolled a stop sign and the police came. I was like, okay, let's see. <laughs> so the police comes, he's like, I need your driver's license. I need your you know, insurance. You rolled the red light. And he's about to write him a ticket, okay? He's like getting it. And I look and I go, thank you, officer. I always tell him to stop at the sign, but <laughs> he doesn't stop. And he looked at me, he looked at him, and he's like, he's going to be in enough trouble. <laughs> so <laughs> he gives back the driver's license. He gives it back and he goes, y'all have a good day. <laughs> and I said, you're welcome. <laughs> So, we, we're not going to change. We're not going to change. I'm sure all of you have tried. If some, And rule number one in psychology is you cannot change someone who doesn't want to change. Okay? Who do we have control over? We only have control of ourselves. And Allah says, Allah will not change the condition of the people until they change themselves. And this is the most important aspect. So I, every marriage program I have, I have like a premarital and the five pillars of marriage. We start with what? Work on yourself. Just like you were saying beautifully, we have to work on ourselves because if we don't, if we don't look inside, if we don't try to make adjustments, then we can't expect for Allah to put the barakat in it, right? When you take on the responsibility and you say, you know what, let's do a social experiment, okay? All of you, are you in? Are you going to do it? Yes? All of you? Okay, not, you're still not sure. She's like, let me hear it. <laughs> All right, social experiment for the next month. I tell some people three months, but let's say one month, you show up as how you were at the beginning. Remember you said at the beginning, I was really pretty, very nice, always cheerful. <laughs> and then it just kind of died down. I want you to just do a social experiment. And you do it first and foremost for the sake of Allah. Say, Ya Allah, because I am getting a grade, and if I have a failing grade, I can't accept that for myself. I am not going to fail as a wife, right? So, and I have to always put a disclaimer, sisters, because I've been doing this long enough to know that there are many cases of abuse, okay? There are many cases of abuse, injustice, and if you're dealing with that, which I'm sure in a room this size, there's at least a handful, if not more, people dealing with domestic violence, with injustice, with all different difficulties, okay? So if you're dealing with that, I would highly recommend getting help, getting some professional help, it's never healthy to, be, to stay in an abusive marriage, and it's not healthy for the kids. You know, a lot of people say, I stayed for my children, but what happens with the children? I work with the children who have been the product of abusive families, and it's not pretty. It's not. It is one of the scariest things you will see. Mental health disorders, drug addicts, people who just go, they go so astray because of a dysfunctional household. So, you know, staying in a marriage, we always hear it's best if mother and father are together. There's a clause that most people don't know about. If there is respect, if there is kindness, if there is you know, there is trust and mutual, right? Because if there isn't, 
then, then their kids are going to witness that, and it is going to bring out all sorts of scary things. So I just say that. I know that if you're in an abusive relationship, that's a different case. But Aren't we just giving the people the opportunity to, to become abusers? Some, yes, yes. Well, so the cycle of abuse, right? A lot of the people who abuse their children or abuse their parents, they were abused, right? And so witnessing this, I, I can't tell you the number of clients. I just had one recently said at she used to see her mom being beaten up, and it would break her heart, and she would cry, and she would have so many issues. Then at 15, she started defending the you know, the mom. And you can't imagine what turmoil that she is in right now and anyone who goes through that, right? So we definitely have to be aware of that. Now, if, if it's not, let's say, abusive and it's just that you're just annoyed from each other, normal issues that come up between husband and wife and you get on each other's nerves and things that they say upset you, maybe you're lacking affection, maybe you are lacking the attention, the quality time. What I would say is a social experiment for one month, you try to give all the things that you're hoping to receive, okay? So you want affection, you initiate, right? You want, what is that saying? Be the change you want to see, right? Because if you're sitting there waiting, he's not going to change. But guess what? If you make changes within yourself, he's going to respond to you. If he's psychologically sound and, he's <laughs> and he doesn't have major issues, the normal, not narcissistic. <laughs> Everyone's like, oh, well, <laughs> there goes that experiment. <laughs> but even with the narcissist, subhanAllah, I've had, I had one case, one lady came in and she was just crying. She was crying profusely. She's like, I don't think I can hang in here anymore. I have tried. And she was a very reasonable, hardworking, you know, sometimes people, you can tell, you can tell when someone is really putting in the effort, but the husband was somewhat narcissistic. And I told her certain things to change. And by the fourth session, she was all smiles and she came in and she goes, I can't believe that only making these small changes has made my husband into a totally different person even though he had certain issues, even though he was very, he was unreasonable, he had the narcissistic person. But he goes, because she made the changes in herself, he responded to her differently, right? So you know a chemical reaction? Any chemists here? No chemists? Usually there's some, <laughs> some biology majors or some. Okay, so a chemical reaction. What would happen if you change one one of the, what is it called? One of the in ingredients or the substance. Yeah, what would happen? It would completely change it, right? With one substance, maybe there's no reaction. Another substance is combustible, right? So when you change, maybe you're that combustible person. Can we admit that? Can we admit that we have maybe some issues? that we need to change, that we may be stubborn, that we may be a little, oh, I'm seeing a lot of guilty smiles, <laughs> that we may need to soften up a bit, right? So when you change that about yourself, guess what happens to your husband? He's just, first of all, he's like, oh, my God, <laughs> what did you do with my wife, right? <laughs> Who are you and what did you do with my wife? <laughs> it, starts, it starts to soften the heart. And as you do the nice things, it may take, at first it's like, is this for real? How long is this going to last? What does she want? One month. <laughs> One month. That's why I usually say three months, okay? For those of you who are overachievers, do this for three months. That'll lock it in, okay? If you do this, I'm telling you, your husband is going to look forward to coming home. 
I had one lady, she came and she was so, so upset. She's like, my husband's a workaholic. He never comes home. He's just, that's all he cares about. Work, masjid, work, masjid, never puts any time. Sorry. <laughs> never puts any time. And I asked her, sister, like when, when he comes home, what are you wearing exactly? She's like, sweats. Okay, what do, what do you talk about? I'm complaining. From the moment he walks in that door, I am ready to complain about the kids, about his mom, about, you know, e everything, right? Okay, and I said, what else? Like, do you do anything fun? No, not really. We don't know. And I said, okay, try this. I said, get yourself looking, look, look pretty, look presentable. You don't have to do it all day, right before he comes. I remember uh, when my daughter was two, she's 18 now, mashallah, I have a 23-year-old, 20 and 18, mashallah. But when she was two, right before my husband would come, like I just put like a little lipstick, right? And it got to a point that anytime I put on lipstick, it's like, is daddy coming? Is baba coming home? <laughs> you take a few minutes. It doesn't have to be all decked out. You know, usually the men complain and they say, well, the only time I see my wife dressed up is when she's going to a woman's party, right? The only time she's, you know, I'm not going to go into details of what, you know, how you're taking care of yourself is only for other ladies, not for the husband, right? So she did that. I told her to dress up. She dressed up. The next appointment, I did not even recognize her. I didn't recognize, not to be mean, but I just didn't because she just was, she, she took, she fixed her hair. She put a little makeup. She put a nice outfit and she looked amazing. And then I told her, so what happened? She's like, oh, my God. And she kept this up, okay? It wasn't just one day, two days, three days. She kept it up. And the workaholic who used to not want to be at home and was using any excuse, I'll volunteer. they need a volunteer, I'll do it. <laughs> just get me out of this house, right? He was looking at his watch. He was looking at his watch seeing when it's six o'clock so he can come home to his wife because she greeted him she made him feel valued because usually the men are like you know i come home it, no one even cares no one it, it doesn't matter she's just on her phone the kids don't care she why should i even come right so look look your best go to the door that makes a world of difference you know we were at a wedding and my husband asked a group of men and he said, I was standing right there. It was like when we were saying goodbye. And he said, if your wife came to the door, and she looked, you know, she looked nice. And she came with a smile. And she greeted you. And she was like, you know, cheerful, maybe even brought the kids and stuff. What, how would you feel? And they're all like, oh, my God, that would be amazing. I think she could come on my back. <laughs> this is what some people were saying, right? Men do not need prolonged periods of time. Like, as women, we need the quality time for a very long period. They need it at critical times. In the morning when they're going, before they're going to work, when they come back, these critical times. If you're there, if you're pleasant, if you're showing love, you're showing support, you're going to be his rock. I mean, look at Khadija radiallahu anha. Like, any time I think about that example, it makes me teary-eyed. She was given salam from Allah for being a righteous wife. It wasn't for the amount of abada she did. It's not for how much Quran she memorized. It was not for the community work. It was her maqam as a wife that earned her salams from Allah and Jibreel alayhi salam. Deliver it. I mean, I get chills. So... If we aspire for that, we aspire to have that, that would be amazing, right? I know some of you are looking at me, it's like, you don't know what I've gone through. I bet I do. <laughs> I've heard it all. I have heard it all, subhanAllah. Now, what I, um, so the social experiment is to try this and see, see the change. You said 15%. What would happen when you give 80%? You're going to see a huge transformation. You said 25%. Start. See what happens if you give 80, 
Really. When you are putting into effort, you're going to see the result. Just like the gardening. If you're just going water, like cup of water, and think, yeah, I watered the garden with one cup. Yeah, right. <laughs> right? Yeah. You said something to plant. You said, even if you don't look at the plant, right? Uh, the, 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 the nugget, right? Yes. Even the look and that's the neck. That leads us to, you know, there's the five A's of loving, okay? These are really, really important. The first is attention. Giving attention to your spouse is so powerful. And we're all in need of it right? How do you feel when someone is really in tune with you? They're listening, they're, you know, they are following up with what you're doing. It feels great. And we're so, we are in need of it. So if you give that attention to your spouse, then it's going, it's going to feed them. And look, we are so much in need of this attention that when someone does not receive it, just like the lady who was looking for her key outside, they start looking outside the home. And I, I, I have at least, like, let's say five cases, sometimes a day, of Muslim couples that are cheating. It's very common. No one talks about it. No one thinks it happens in our communities. The most unsuspecting people are involved with this because they're hungry, they're, they're starving. If you're starving and you see a cold pizza, how you're gonna, you're gonna grab it and have it, right? If you've had a seven course meal and you see a cold pizza, how do you, how do you feel about it? You don't even look at it. Mm, I get so much better at home, right? Yes. Yes. And this is this is a very important part of the attention because usually we're just like each person. Nothing can compete yeah. with the phone, right? Because it's got all your favorite things. It's stimulating. It's funny. It's <laughs> and so what we need to do, and I tell my clients this, is have a phone. Phone free time, phone free. Meal time, we're not allowed to have it at the table either, right? If as soon as my, if one of my kids put it on there, mom, it's Islamic lecture. I don't care what it is, right? <laughs> I don't care. We, this is our time. So phone free time, put the phones away and look into each other's eyes, okay? So first A is what was what? Okay, attention. All right, the next the next A is appreciation. Appreciation. How great does it feel when let's say when you have a dinner party, okay, and your friends come and they eat your food and oh my god, it's so delicious. Oh, I love how you decorated your home. It makes you feel great. What if people come, they eat and then they just leave, they don't say anything, right? Show that appreciation to your spouse. When was the last time you complimented your husband? Today? High five, sister. Good job. What'd you say? <laughs> you don't have to share. <laughs> okay. You look good. Okay. Men need the compliment just as much as we do, right? So make sure you give the compliments and the appreciation. I told that one lady, remember the one, um, she said her husband's a workaholic. I said, when was the last time you, um, you appreciated the fact that he's working? So like, he's just doing his job. Why do I have to thank him? Uh-oh, some guilty laughs. Okay. <laughs> well, in the same way, I mean, couldn't he have the same attitude, right? He could say, well, you're, just, you're taking care of the house, you're taking care of the kids, that's just your job. We don't, sometimes, and it's just because it's us girls in the room, right? We're ignoring the... Well, the slim edict? Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's like saying, you know, may Allah preserve your hands and thank you so much. Right. So, 
Sometimes we have a double standard. Would you agree? We want the appreciation, we want the compliments, we want the love and all that, but we're not willing to give it, okay? So let's try. Part of the social experiment, give compliments. Oh my God, you look really great in this. Don't say something, I mean, be genuine, right? Because he's going to be like, what is, what's wrong with her? <laughs> be genuine. Um, and then especially if, how many of you are working moms? Okay, all right. How many stay-at-home moms? A lot of stay-at-home moms? Okay. So just show appreciation for the fact that he's working, right? That makes a big difference. The third A, so first A was attention. Second A, appreciation. Third A is affection, okay? Affection. You have to show your love. And you have to show your love in the way he likes it. How many of you know what the golden rule is? What is the golden rule? The golden rule. There's a golden rule. There you go. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> oh, whoever makes the gold. Oh, okay. Well, the golden rule, do on to others as you would want to have done to you, does not apply in marriages. Does not apply. Why doesn't it apply? Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> Give this lady a prize. <laughs> Good job. Everyone's love language is different. What else is different? One hundred, one hundred. Sometimes it doesn't work out that way, right? Sometimes it's 60, 40. Sometimes it's 90, 10. But it's good to come in with the mindset to want to give, right? The reason the golden rule does not apply, because first of all, man and woman, right? We want very different things. And if we do what we want, the guy's going to feel suffocated. Right? I'll give you a very simple example. Let's take, for instance, I've, I've spoken to so many men, and I ask him, like, if you were crying, would you want anyone there? Would you want anyone next to you? Almost, uh, up until today, I could say all men <laughs> say they don't, they want to be alone until today. <laughs> until today. Why? <laughs> that messed up my 100%. Okay, that's okay. There are some exceptions, right? But generally, the majority, I would say over 98% of the men say if they're crying, they want to be alone. Okay? Now, what about major majority of what? How many of you want to be comforted when you are crying? Raise a hand. Raise a hand. Okay. So you see a majority, right? So between the spouses, yes, of course. To show, exactly. Sure, but from your spouse, right? So if the man applies this, he goes, I want to be alone, but then he marries someone who wants to be comforted, and when she's crying, he leaves the room thinking, I'm respecting her, I'm giving her space. Then what ends up happening? Oh, I knew he doesn't love me. I just knew it, right? So what do we have to do? We have to communicate. Before we got married, you know, we met actually in um, at the MSA in the University of Houston. And at that time, Sheikh Yasser Qadi was our imam. You know that? Like 30 years, <laughs> over 30 years ago. And then one of the things I told my husband I said, if I tell you I don't want to talk about it, don't listen to me. I really do want to talk about it. <laughs> you just have to insist a little bit more, right? So you have to give the key to your heart to your spouse, all right? So that's, and then the affection, we talked about affection, right? And just find out how the person wants the affection. 
Some people, some people want to be hugged. Some people want to find out. And that's where we've said the uh, golden rule doesn't apply because if you do what you like, that person is kind of like talking Swahili. If someone in Swahili is saying they love you, you don't even understand it, right? So you have to say the loving words. Uh, and then the fourth A is accepting. What do you think it means to accept your spouse? What do you think? Any ideas? Ex A whole package, right? Yeah. You, exactly. You know, um, sometimes people come in and they're doing premarital counseling, and it's just like, yeah, you know, she just she just needs to put on a job, and she just needs to, yeah, you know, and she just needs to change this. She needs to change her dressing. She needs to do all of these things. Then she's going to be a really great wife. And then the, the, the wife might be, or the spouse to be, well, he just, he needs to become a doctor. <laughs> he needs to become more religious. That's if, the first time I've heard that. He what? needs to become a doctor? Oh, yeah. Wow. I had, actually, one of my friends said, if you don't change your major, my parents are not going to accept. Really? So he, yeah, he went from engineering to physician <laughs> to get the approval. All right, so accepting the whole package, right? What does that include? Their looks, right? Sometimes we can be very critical of each other. So their looks, we have to accept their capability, right? Some people are more capable than others. You have to accept maybe some of the, the family, right? It's a package. Like some people, it's really interesting because I have, I've had this conversation with many, many sisters where the husband is like, please, you know, Call my call my mother. Call my my. They they want to hear from you. And she's like, I'm I'm not required. Islamically, I have no responsibility. How many of you have heard that and have seen that? It's n that's that's beautiful. It's not from the akhlaq. and fiqh is very different, right? In the sense that, and I use this analogy or look at it this way. The man, fiqh, if we want to talk fiqh, suddenly everyone's into fiqh. Yeah. <laughs> I am not responsible for my mother-in-law. Oh, I'm, I'm seeing some dirty looks too. Exactly. Well, when I, I ask the sister, I go, fiqh, if you're interested in fiqh now, the man is only responsible to provide what? Shelter, food, basics. <laughs> we cannot do that, right? And how many of us are willing to apply the fiqh in this aspect? That we want the max. Give me the best house. Give me the best vacations. Take me to the best restaurants. So you see the discrepancy? So we can't, like, expect the best but then give the bare minimum it's just it's just not islamic akhlaq like you were saying and if you give and you are loving to your in-laws you will win your the heart of your spouse exactly. right they are good with your mother exactly sometimes the connection is not made yeah. <laughs> right? And, and another very important thing is, I ask the people who say, I'm not talking to her, she's toxic, his mom is so toxic, I can't handle all that negativity, no. And I said, okay, do you have a son? Yes. All right, your cutie little son grows up, gets married, and, that's, and that daughter-in-law, what if she says, oh, your mom is so toxic, I cannot handle her negativity. <laughs> We can't. I can't. Would you accept that? Come on. <laughs> you would be like, oh, heck no, right? No girl is going to, you just divorce her. That's what they, you know, the, the advice would be, right? So we have to have, we have to be fair. We have, and, and what goes around comes around. If you don't allow your in-laws into your home, which this is the reality. 
reality. Someone said, oh, I want to invite my parents. Okay, as long as, you know, as long as I'm somewhere else, if I'm, I'm in, I don't know, wherever, <laughs> I, they can come, right? So we have to be really fair about this. The last A is allowing. Allowing. What do you, what do you think? Allowing. Allowing what? Okay. Allow them to have free time. Allow them to have hobbies. Yes. There you go. Allow them to be themselves, not constantly micromanaging. Don't be a mom. Okay. The biggest mistakes that people make, they become a parent. You know, the quickest way to end any desire that your spouse may have for you is to act like a mom. Okay, so acting like a mom. Did you pray? Have you, uh, did you <laughs> go, to the go to the masjid, pray there? Have you read your Quran? What? Did you shower? <laughs> Have you showered? What else? Yeah. They, what is that? They leave their clothes on the ground. Oh, pick up after yourself. What did you say? Telling them to clean up, do this, do that, and micromanaging, right? Yeah, please. Yeah, well, that that's, but that's pro that's problematic, right? Because let me let me address this one. If he's saying you love, maybe you're showing more affection, more attention. But if you you know, first and foremost, say I came up with a priority pyramid, and think of a pyramid but upside down. Okay, the biggest part, the first is Allah, right? Next, and people freaked out when I said this eight years ago. <laughs> and now, alhamdulillah, more people are talking about it. But next is self-care. Self-care. Yes. And, but a lot of people, because we've been raised with sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. And isar, it's a beautiful aspect of our deen. It is necessary at times. But if you neglect your health... If you neglect your mental health, if you neglect your physical health, if you're a sick, depressed, depleted woman, what can you give to anyone, right? So self-care, next is who? Kids or a spouse? Good, you've seen the pyramid? <laughs> they freaked out about this too. They're like, no, 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 my kids, they, they need me. If you don't make your husband a priority, then when the kids grow up and they leave, you're going to be left with a stranger. Because a lot of times what happens is the man becomes resentful of the kids. Ahem, ahem. <laughs> all right. Because he feels that he, they're, they're taking all the attention. Right? But if you continue to give him love, if you continue to give him respect, then he's going to love the kids with you. It's not a competition, right? All right. And then the allowing, yes, be, allow them. Allow them to pursue if they have some dreams. Don't shoot down their dreams. Give the support. Any questions, you guys? Yes. You know, first of all, you have to create a positive association to coming home. Positive assertion. If as soon as he comes home, it, it's like, and I remember I, I was stay-at-home mom for a period of time when my kids were little, and I used to think my husband's at a picnic, you know, well, he was, <laughs> he's at a picnic, why aren't you home yet? And when he'd come, it was like, okay, you want to pass the baton? Why don't you not take over with the kids? You have to real. and now that I work full-time overtime, there are times I come home and I'm just like maxed out. I'm like, I, I don't want anyone to ask anything of me, right? So seeing both perspective, it is important when someone comes home and it, you have to alternate, right? It can't always be that like, oh, you know, you have all this time and the mom has gone through a really hard day too. But if your husband is having 
an especially difficult time or is stressed out, let him unwind, let him have that time, and don't nag. Because a lot of time, when, when a man says, not a lot of times, when they say, I don't want to talk about it, they really, it's not like me saying, no, no, it really insists. <laughs> it, they really don't want to talk about it. And when you keep pushing and insisting, it's very annoying, okay? So give that space, allow it, and then, uh, because sometimes men have to go more internal, they need that space, and then, and the sharing has to do with your reaction. Because sometimes when they shared, you may have overreacted. You may have been judgmental. You may have criticized. And so he's like, you know what? I'm not doing that again. So be careful about how you're reacting so that it will be something that they'd want to do again. Okay? Yes, in the bathroom. Remove what in the bathroom? Dirty clothes. Yeah, these things, you know, I would, I would suggest having a family meeting, okay, saying, look, I know it's annoying when I nag, okay, uh, what can we do? I always say this, and like the men who say, I, I'm just so annoying, she nags, and I, I'm like, guess what, she won't nag if you do it, <laughs> right? Let's... Right. A lot of times what happens is that men may need, they may need a reminder, okay? But let it come from them, right? So in a sense, ask, I don't want to nag, and we have these problems. What, what would you like me to do? Or what's the solution? Have him generate a solution. If you're doing, ev if you're doing everything that we're saying, and he still doesn't pick up, is that what you're saying? Or he still doesn't change? And that's why the solution has to come from him, right? So sometimes with my clients, I will tell them, you need a code word. You need something that you can say, and then it, you don't have to be nagging, right? Some funny term, something funny. You say it, and he knows what you're referring to. Right. That's a beautiful reminder, sisters. I think all of, we, all of you need this. We all need this reminder. You couldn't hear. So she was saying there are certain things, there are, cer there are certain things that you come to terms with that it's not going to change. My husband is not going to stop at the stops. <laughs> okay. It's not happening. <laughs> all right. And then she's saying that you remind yourself at that time there's other wonderful things he does, right? And m my husband talks about this, about um, he was very particular about where he squeezes his toothpaste. Don't, don't ask me why. <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> he likes it from the bottom. Okay, so when we first got married, I'm just like, <laughs> from the middle, okay? So... <laughs> Initially, he, they, that was irritating, and sometimes I didn't put the lid back, okay? So, oh, my God. <laughs> She's shocked. Okay, are you, like, very much? <laughs> Don't judge. I didn't judge you. <laughs> All right, uh, okay, so the thing is, initially it was irritating him. And every time he's like, oh my gosh, like how, now I do it, okay, I put the lid back on. <laughs> All right. And then he reminded himself, he's like one day, he saw this, he was irritated, and he's like, oh my gosh, like if anything was to happen to my spouse, I, you know, I, I would be looking for that, you know, the squeeze, or like the shoes that are in the living room, or the towel that is on the ground. So you remind yourself, and you... Show gratitude for what you have. I think there were a couple of hands, yeah. yeah that, that's very tough. And we experienced this. You know, my husband always used to go to work and come back. And then for the past 10 years, we, um, he, mashallah, even though he's very successful in doing oil field services, he decided he believes in what I'm doing. And mashallah, he came to support, you know, the marriage of helping Muslims have a better marriage. So he's been working from home. 
10 years now, right? And it's not an easy thing because I really like that. Oh, okay, Baba's kind. Let me go put that. Right? Now it's like Baba's here all the time. <laughs> He's always here, right? So I get it. It's, it is very challenging and um, trying to, it's always good to have some time apart, right? I mean, even when it, it's like your me time, maybe taking that, whether it's exercising, time with your friends, because it really becomes hectic. All right. Jazakallah khairan.